Traditions, values, culture. These are the things that help us remember where we came from. It's time for Family Heritage Stories with your host, Doug Jessup. Hi, this is Doug Jessup. Welcome to Family Heritage Stories, where we talk about what makes us who we are. Things like traditions, values, culture. How are these things passed down from generation to generation? Through words, through deeds, through stories. Welcome to Family Heritage Stories. With me today, this guy right here, Matthew Davis. What does heritage mean to you? Heritage means to me where I come from, the pride in my ancestry, and also the people around me, their ancestries. Yeah, okay, so let's talk about them a little bit. Your mother's side, you've got the adoption thing going on, but you know, did you have grandparents on your mother's side? I did, and they're very special to me. Tell me about them. My grandmother was, grew up in Parowan. My grandfather, adopted grandfather, from um, families from Louisiana. And uh, he did a lot of hunting, which is how he met my grandmother in Parowan. She was a Johnson in Parowan. They are still there. I get stories like, oh, I grew up in Parowan. Your uncle's cop Johnson. It's like, that's my uncle. Um, Lillian Johnson, she, um, she also has great caring kids with her name. Uh, she was a very proper lady. I remember going to Bullock's Wilshire as a little toddler kid, three, four, sitting, bored, eating strawberries off of her lady's plates during the fashion shows that they used to do. <laughs> she had an account at these LA, this was in LA, these LA high-end stores, Bullock's Wilshire and such. Um, Lillian, we got this dress you'd love. Do you want us to send it to you? Yes, send it to me. You know, she was very like that. So we, me and my oldest sister were always dressed the same. We were, she also passed away in the 70s. Um, and my grandfather was always there. He loved us to death. He uh, was a great man. And I had a really strong relationship with him. He passed when I was 17, and that was one of the hardest things in my life. I hear you. The, uh, the last time I, this is hard, the last time I talked to him, I'd go down from California, or from up here to Salt Lake to California, and I'd go visit him every time. I had a quick trip, and he called me and said, you didn't come and visit me. I didn't get to see him again. So. Years and years now, okay? Yeah. I said, okay, what's, what's your, you know, how do you describe your grandpa? How do you want them to describe you? He always made me smile. He always made me feel loved. And he always made me feel safe. With another entry in a Family Heritage Stories, I'm Doug Jessup. Everyone has a story. Have you told your story? This is Doug Jessup. It would be my honor to help you tell your story with a private in-studio interview with a video for you to keep. Go to FamilyHeritageStories.com for pricing and to schedule your interview. What kind of values are you passing down to the next generation? I recently had a conversation with my granddaughter and the subject of boys came up. Oh boy. Well, she has a list of three values that she's thinking are important. Number one, be honest. Number two, be kind. And number three, be helpful. Pretty good list. What do you think? Sometimes we have what I would kind of call a defining moment. And you and I were chatting a little bit off camera. And so uh, tell me what is McKay's defining moment? Well, I'd have to reach back for the first large defining moment of my life was when I was 15. I was working on a farm, a sod farm in Payson, Utah. Sod is the grass you put in your front yard. We were working on a harvester, cutting up the grass and stacking it in pallets. This harvester is 14 ton. We're moving it from one edge of the field to the other uh, one morning. And I'm walking alongside my friend who's sitting on the platform over the dual rear wheels of this large harvester. 
I think I'm going to sit, jump up and sit next to him. So turn my back to the machine, jump up backside first, jump too far, and I land in front of the wheels. Now, I thought, well, uh, I landed on my feet so I can jump out of the way, but before I could, the wheel caught my right foot and started to run up my right foot. And when it did, it threw me on the ground, and here I was now in quite a predicament. My, that machine is going to run over me from my feet to my head, and there's nothing that I can do about it. So it ran across my knee, broke my femur right here above my knee in half. Your pelvis is shaped like this, crushed my pelvis, twisted me sideways, broke my lower back, broke most of my ribs, all my ribs but three, broke my back in my thoracic region, and rolled off just missing my head. When I came to, I passed out after that. Everything hurt. Uh, I didn't know it then, but my lungs had collapsed, and my lungs were now stuck together like a wet paper sack. The air was in my chest cavity with nowhere to go, and I couldn't get oxygen to my brain, to my heart, to my body. So I was experiencing extreme pain, and I knew I was going to die. I just had this sense that I was going to die, and I couldn't wait until I could so the pain could go away. Well, Stan, the farm manager, came up and he knelt down and he just he took my he took put his hands out like this around my head and just started to talk to me and for whatever reason he just started to make pro proclamations mckay you'll graduate from high school mckay you're going to attend university you're going to walk again you're going to become a leader and as he started to make these proclamations i started to latch hold of the words he was saying and i had this tug of war going on one dragging me to death and the other one sort of having hope in his words. And I started to think, okay, I can hold on for two minutes, and then 10 minutes. And sure enough, I finally gained the confidence that I was gonna be able to outlast uh, what it was gonna take till the ambulance arrived, which they eventually did, and obviously I survived, and here I am. But I learned a really important lesson, and that lesson is this, that our words have great power. One of the reasons I love what you do with gratitude and positivity is you're spreading words that can have a big impact on people's life. And I've, you know, later in my life, I read to, and studied in my PhD program, Abraham Hichel, who was a contemporary of Martin Luther King. And he marched with King at Selma and other places. And he had left, uh, his parents were killed by the Nazis. He had escaped and he, had, he saw how words had created the propaganda that preceded the crematoria and everything else that would come along later and tried to teach his fellow seminarians this power of words to create worlds. And I've experienced that firsthand in my life uh, and it was a real defining moment and I've tried to dedicate some of my life the best way I could to giving words of encouragement and words of power to people. Well, words definitely matter. I mean, you know, it, it's one of my pet peeves, I admit. Okay, you remember when we were kids, you know, sticks and stones may you know, break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I call BS, you know, because words do matter. Um, and they can incite people to do stupid things, but they can also get people to do things that are very powerful, very positive, very inspirational. I agree with you wholeheartedly. You know, one of the things I believe is you can't be what you can't see. You know, the Japanese have a saying that says, Ino naka no kawazu takayo shirazu, and it means a frog in a well cannot conceive of the ocean. And what words allow us to do is see beyond our current circumstances and see beyond our limitations to imagine and to, Im to grab on, to latch on to things that we might not otherwise to give us hope and confidence and all of those other wonderful things that we need to become who we should become. The last words that my grandfather said were, please remember me. This is Doug Jessup. It would be my honor to help you share your story with a private in-studio interview with a video for you to keep. Go to familyheritagestories.com for pricing and to schedule your interview. There's a reason why people celebrate Scandinavian days or things like Day of the Dead. It's one word, culture. Now, I know family means a big deal to you. It does. And this country was made from people coming from all over the world. 
And so you and I have talked about this before, and we have some common homeland, if you will. So my mother's 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 mother, okay, how's that, five, okay, is a woman by the name of Anna Maria Laschansky, okay, and she's from what's now the Czech Republic. And I understand that you've got some relatives from that same general area. I do. Um, I'm a little closer than <laughs> okay. you are. Um, it was my great grandmother who came over from the Czech Republic, Rosa Mashek. My grandmother, Helen Janik, was married to Eddie Janik, uh, who went into the military as well um, and served in World War II. And that, that was the USO picture I was telling you mm -hmm. about. What kind of music did the Eddie Yannick band perform? Well, it's the Eddie Yannick Orchestra. Oh, excuse me, Eddie Orchestra. Yannick Orchestra. Okay, okay. Because it's it, it's old school, full on Czech polka. Oh ho, polka! Mm -hmm. Okay, so did you do some polka dancing as a little Absolutely. girl? Absolutely. Oh yeah. So if I remember right, there's the saxophone. Mm -hmm. You got to have a tuba. Yes. Okay, what other kind of instruments would have been in his orchestra? Uh, clarinet, drums, horns. It was like a big brass band. What instrument did he play? He played sax and clarinet. I have a clarinet that he purchased and then my mother played and the rest of the siblings played and then my son played it in band. Really? Yeah. So that's cool. So your son got to play his grandfather's clarinet. His Great, great grandfather's father's oh, clarinet. Wow. Oh, that has got to be so cool. It is really neat. Um, and we found out it, it's a pretty awesome specimen because I had to have the pads changed and things. And the people who fixed it were just floored. I played flute and bassoon. Bassoon was my favorite um, and did percussion. Music is a, is a big part of my life. Human connection. That's what it's about from cave art to doing videos on our phones for our grandkids. We're just trying to make a connection with people that we know and love. Sometimes these stories stand the test of time. Recently, I did a bunch of interviews with some veterans from a very special unit, the 159th Medical Evacuation Group called Dust Off, served in Vietnam. What is the value and the power of a story? Ooh, ask Mara. It's priceless. It's priceless to me because I, when I was first sitting with the guys listening to their stories, it's something you just can't get back. And there's a lot of stories I wish I would have had recorded from my dad, my mom, my grandparents. So at least we were able to get these stories recorded and to have them uh, videoed and digitized is key because the younger generation you know, sitting with my nephews, doing homework with them uh, over COVID. They weren't looking at books, they were looking at screens, and they can look at this on a screen. Everyone has a story. This is Doug Jessup. It would be my honor to help you tell your family heritage story. Here's how it works. We'll schedule a professional interview at the same studio I do my TV show. We already have the broadcast cameras, audio, and lighting set up to ensure quality control. All you need to do is come to our Salt Lake City studio and we'll do the rest. Our professional editing staff will take out bloopers and add your pictures to create a private digital video for you to keep. Go to FamilyHeritageStories.com for pricing and to schedule your interview. Everyone has unique skills and talents. My grandfather was a furniture maker by trade, but as a kid, I remember him always having a camera. Well, those old films and those old pictures influenced me to become a broadcaster. How did you get into your occupation? You had an interesting little experience in third grade. Third grade. Yes, I went uh, to back to school night with my mom and dad, and as we went walking in, the room there was a girl standing by the door and she said to her, her mother look mom there's the artist in our class and then i heard that that went deep into me and i said to myself i said yes that's what i am i'm an artist there's a painting upstairs that is above your fireplace that is in a meadow and there's a young man what's the story behind that painting that painting is an interesting story. I 
uh, it started when uh, President Nelson said in conference, when he was announcing about the 200 year celebration, he said, go home and figure out what you need to do to prepare for that conference. And then um, I turned to Cynthia and I said, there are two paintings I needed to do, have wanted to do for a long time on the Sacred Grove. And I told her that I needed to get that painting done. And uh, so I started meeting with the church historian, uh, Don Anders, and I got, you know, spent a lot of time preparing, getting ready for that. And then COVID hit and I couldn't go. And, uh, but I was so disappointed because I had worked so hard getting ready to do a painting. But last July, so a year ago from this month, I had a dream. And the dream was very clear and really interesting. I, there was no sound, but I could see this uh, young man standing on a grassy knoll. I was able to look at his clothes really closely. I could see he had on uh, pants that were too big for him. They were uh, coarsely made. I, he had a shirt that was way too large. I mean, they were both kind of drowning him. He had a blanket over his shoulders and a big floppy hat. Doug, you would have loved his hat. Gotta love hats. All okay. messed up yeah. and crunched up and everything. And I knew it was Joseph Smith when he was 14. And he was on his way to the Grove. And and then my dream ended and I woke, woke up and I told Cynthia about it. And um, so I can't paint from my head. I have to go someplace and research, I have to research a painting, but I have to go to the place. It's really important for me to kind of touch and feel the landscape or whatever I'm painting. Um, say if I'm doing a historical painting, then there's buildings in it that are not there. I build little models to um, help me visualize because I can't paint. I can see it in my head. It's like if I say to you, uh, draw me a horse, and you can see a horse in your mind, and so can I, but I can't draw from that. I have Neither to... can I. <laughs> but that's just because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> that's frustrating to me as an artist, but I go find a horse and I can draw it. You know, if I can look at something, I can draw it. So I used my grandson. I rented clothes from This Is A Place Monument and dressed him up like I saw in my dream and uh, or similarly to my dream and uh, I posed him out in the field he was a good sport because you know 14 year olds and he's 14 they stand a certain way it's not <laughs> not a man with his shoulders back you yeah, know well they kind of slouch a bit well and, I will say just so you know that the hat that that he's wearing is also called a slouch just Oh, really? I'm not sure if that's coincidental <laughs> but just say <saying>. just a little <laughs> heavy on yeah well you know anyway so anyway uh I've worked through a real long, tedious process of trying to get it not to look like Isaiah, the, my model, but what was in my mind from the dream. Oh, yeah. And I, I spent months trying to get that face right because I thought that was pretty important. So um, the painting is of Joseph on his way to the grove and he stopped and he's just thinking don't know what he was thinking, but uh, so that was that's the painting that's upstairs. Okay. Stories get passed down in all kinds of different directions, and sometimes it's because somebody wrote it down. You have a Torah that is more than a Torah to me. It's more than a, a scroll of of writings. It has a story behind it. Can you share that? It's four hundred years old. It originated from the Netherlands um, and was created by people who uh, had left Portugal after the Inquisition and gone to uh, the Netherlands um, to be able to have freedom of religion. You know, it just makes you think, okay, here is a Torah that's 400 years old. Mm -hmm. And to think of the people right. that have read that, that, that have heard that being spoken, I mean, it's just, just awe striking. You think about all the things that have happened in the world and in the Jewish world since that Torah was written. Europe used to have a very 
vibrant Jewish community and um, in some places still do, but other places the, those communities have been decimated. And so when I walk through those synagogues, I think about the people that used to pray in there and the pride they took in their synagogue and the people who would gossip in the hallways and, uh, and the kids who would get in trouble for running and being too loud. And uh, with this Torah, I think about how when it was written, um, the pride that that community must have had in it and the number of people who heard it and studied from it and maybe became bar mitzvah through that Torah um, hundreds of years ago. And part of the thing with that Torah is that before our families even could conceive that we would would exist someday, like great, 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 great grandparents reading from that Torah scroll, they were hoping that one day their descendants would read from that same Torah and that we would keep that tradition going and that we would pass it on to future generations. What would it mean to you to have a video of your mom, dad, grandma, or grandpa telling their story? This is Doug Jessup. It would be my honor to help share their story with a private in-studio interview with a video for you to keep. Go to familyheritagestories.com for pricing and to schedule your interview. How do you want to be remembered? It's not just a question for old people, okay? I remember in junior high, we had a writing assignment to write down our own obituary. A little macabre, but at the same time, I understand now what they were trying to do. They were saying, what are you doing now, but also what can you do in the future to make sure that you are remembered the way you want to be remembered? Technically, she's my third favorite Dorothy. Sorry, because I've got a granddaughter named Dorothy, okay? I've got a mother-in-law named Dorothy, but she's my third favorite Dorothy. Dorothy Bale, okay? Now, Dorothy, I have to admit, when I first met you, you know how I remembered your name? Besides the fact that Dorothy's, there's Dorothy Gale, and Dorothy Bale. And so Dorothy Gale, you know, was the character Wizard of Oz. And so it was my favorite movie. So it's like, hey, I got to talk to this lady. So what's happened since we last chatted? Do you remember our last conversation back at Arby's? At Arby's? Oh, that was just before I had to leave. Yeah. Be, be, because my knees were giving out and, and I had to leave Arby's after 26 years. Wow. Now, here's the thing you may not know. This woman right here, she actually retired as the oldest Arby's employee in the entire country. And you did you know that once we did that story, that was picked up by TV stations and websites all across, not just the country, all across the world. <laughs> so um, now a couple quick questions for you. Um, so is the Reuben still your favorite? Oh, yes. Okay. Always. Okay. What is your favorite soft drink at Arby's? Well, a Coke. Coke. Okay. Now, they've got the curly fries, but now they have the, reg the regular, I don't know what you call them. So, do you like the curly fries or the new ones? The new ones. The new ones? Yes. Really? Okay. They are the best. Okay. So, um, now, you have a birthday. Like, you know, it's, it's birthday day, okay? So, um, you know, you're not supposed to ask a woman how old she is. But a woman could possibly volunteer. <laughs> we could. <laughs> How about 99 years old? Oh, awesome. Good job. <laughs> so um, now, you know, you gave me some interesting advice way back then. So I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked back then, okay? You have lived on this earth for 99 years. <laughs> what is your secret to longevity? Being active all of your life, working and doing things that you enjoy doing. I was in high school when World War II broke out. Right. In Colorado, right? In Colorado, yes. And then um, uh, in Ogden, Utah, they were asking for people to come there to make bombs. Wow. Well, one of my friends and I, we decided we would go on the train and go to Ogden, Utah. Well, her mother wouldn't let her go. <laughs> okay. So I went. I got on the train in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. I went to Salt Lake and changed trains, and I went to Ogden. Well, when I got there, I was um, I were, had my typing and shorthand, and I didn't go make bombs. They put me in an office. See, for a second there, I thought you were going to say you were Rosie the Riveter. Yeah, but... <laughs> But Dorothy the typist. 
Dorothy the typist. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, that's what I did all through the life until um, uh, my husband died and we, after 36 years in the office. And then um, uh, and then uh, he was gone for a year, and that's when I went to uh, work for Arby's. Mm -hmm. And um, they took me to a big convention in Las Vegas. Uh, I was the oldest in the whole company, and I really enjoyed every minute of it. Now, of course, everybody knows I'm the TV hat man, okay? <laughs> yes. I got to wear this funky-looking hat. It was original, the original one. She got one, too. You know, so I'm just saying, when we did our story, we both had, I have to admit, I'm going, I got to I gotta meet this fellow hat-wearing lady. So, oh, he has wonderful hats. <laughs> now, the other thing that you noticed, because I'm doing TV garden guy stuff, and you told me back then um, that you love your garden. Yes, I did love my garden, and you brought me some gardening tools. Yes, I did. Yes. So yes. what's your favorite flowers? Oh, I know it depends, but... Oh, um, uh, geraniums. I always yeah. loved the geraniums. <laughs> okay. And uh, and we had a corner lawn, and I would go out there and work in the yard, and I loved it. You told me the last... Now, granted, this was a while back. You And we, we ran this, and I says, you know, and I've told my kids and my grandkids the same thing that Dorothy Bale said. She says, you know, I don't worry about yesterday. I don't worry about tomorrow. I just live for today. Today. That's right. <laughs> live for today. Oh, we run. That's what we do. We can, can't do one thing about yesterday or, or tomorrow. Just every minute during the day. Have you ever wondered how an object becomes important enough to pass down to the next generation? Imagine your great-grandfather playing his prize piano. Ashton Young says he can almost hear him and picture where the piano is bent. And his brothers and sisters would actually load this piano up on horse and buggy. They'd have these big events where they would play their music. The 1913 heirloom made its way down the family line and next belonged to Young's prodigy pianist, Grandpa. You'd name the tune and he'd just play it. And even though Young never knew those relatives... My great-grandfather died in the 70s and my grandpa died the same year I was born. Stories of their lives are music to his ears, and why he recently had the heirloom instrument restored for his family. I want my children, as they grow up, playing on the piano, that knowing that their great grandfather learned to play the piano on this. It's my honor to help people remember where they came from. To me, if stories aren't passed down from generation to generation, they become lost, and it's as though those people never existed. How do you want to be remembered? With another entry into Family Heritage Stories, I'm Doug Jessup. <laughs>